up guys? I hope you enjoyed that intro. We worked extremely hard on it. We spent literally every single day shooting sunrises, sunsets, putting together as much music options as possible, sound effects. And the best part of it is that we got to work with Epidemic Sound again. And Epidemic Sound is actually our video sponsor today. And the reason I want to talk to you guys about Epidemic Sound is because of how valuable they've been in terms of me as a creator. Uh, they've not only allowed me to have the best music options in terms of the YouTube videos I share, but they've also allowed for me to look at creating videos and photos in a different way. The last video I did with them was about how to bring your photos to life using sound. And you know, I demonstrated how you can animate your photo and then include sound effects to really make it a lot more alive. This time around, I want to talk about how you can enhance your cinematography, your, your videos, your film experience and share with people maybe something that feels a lot more real and something that may be even more compelling. Uh, compelling in the sense that it allows them to visit New York City and compelling in the sense that you guys check out Epidemic Sound. Now, they have an extensive library of music options on their website and also sound effects, which is, I think, very important. So I urge you guys to check out Epidemic Sound. The link's in my bio. You guys get 30 days free membership, which is awesome. You get to go wild with all their music options and, you know, create some really cool content and be sure to tag me. I'd love to see what you guys come up with. Now, for today's video, we're also talking about architecture photography. And as I mentioned previously, this is a very important thing to me. And I think that you guys are gonna benefit from this video quite a lot. Architecture photography is something that I've been dabbling for a very long time. It actually started in my undergrad studies in urban design and architecture school that I got an interest in architecture photography. And in doing so, I was able to explore new methods of really seeing things in a different perspective. And I think that that's something I want you guys to take away from today's video. And before we start all that, I want you guys to enjoy another cool footage of New York City. Now, in explaining architecture photography for you guys, what I've done is I've jotted down hundreds of notes and hundreds of ideas that I've uh, not only developed but learned along the way in terms of photography over the years. A lot of this is inspired by my knowledge in urban planning and architecture specifically, uh, which is one of the reasons why I've always enjoyed architecture photography and also one of the reasons why I continue to do it to this day. In going through all these things, I want to kind of break down the steps I would take if I were to go out and shoot a city or if I, you know, started with no knowledge. What were the steps I would take? Uh, or give anyone in terms of going out and shooting architecture. The first thing that comes to my mind typically is get a tea. The reason I'm saying that is because it's really cold here in Toronto as well. So not only in New York it's cold, but also in Toronto. But going back, the first thing I think about actually is gear. And gear is a very important component to shooting architectural buildings. And I'm not saying go out and buy all this stuff I'm gonna to recommend to you, but think about the type of gear you have because each gear is set specifically for a type of photo. Um, I know people who've been rocking a 50 millimeter for the end of time and they continue to use it for everything. And that's amazing because that shows diversity and variety in one specific lens. But can you do so much more with other lenses? Of course you can. So that being said, there's three lenses I usually would recommend anyone who wants to shoot architecture. You always need a fisheye or a wide angle lens, such as a 16 to 35, which is the one I'm currently using to shoot this video on right now. Uh, the second would be something in between, uh, um, maybe a zoom lens and a wide angle lens, such as uh, 24 to 70. Um, so you're getting enough focal length and you're also getting enough wide angle coverage so that you can shoot a landscape shot and you can also zoom in and use it for video and you know portraits and whatnot. The last lens is this beauty right here. This is the 7200. This is a zoom lens so you're going to be getting closer to the subject and specifically when it comes to architecture if you can't really get close to a building this is your go-to. In times where you're you know flying uh, in a helicopter or something like that this is also a very solid lens to bring with you. Other lenses that obviously um, many people would recommend are tilt-shift lenses. These are lenses that tilt and shift. 
essentially. Um, and they allow you to play around with your focus points and that's very important because then you can, you know, blur out certain parts of the image and then really focus on another and also get a larger, much um, broader image uh, of the buildings that you might be shooting. Um, and fisheye lenses, which I do not have, maybe like 11 millimeter, I, I feel like you can even go further than that, but you have to understand with anything that is um, too wide, you start to get distortions, and that's something to really think about. And in terms of the architecture photography I shoot, I try to avoid that stuff. I want it to seem realistic and um, almost like what you would see with your own naked eye. So I hope that kind of provides you with some information on what lenses I would bring with me if I were to go shoot. And for New York this time around, I actually only brought one specific lens. I brought the 24 to 70 and I brought my 1DX uh, with me. The reason why I brought that set together was because I wanted to travel very light and I wanted to be able to get around uh, not with back pain <laughs> to, to start off with. Having a lot of gear with you is extremely heavy and you have to try to avoid that if you're especially roaming around the city and shooting, which we were for this video specifically. So I try to travel light. I want something that would give me focal length as well as the, the option to go wide and I used it for everything. So majority of the images you're going to see right now are shot with that lens specifically. So if that's something you're interested in getting, I recommend it. Now, the second thing I want to talk to you guys about is location, location, location. Uh, that was something that my professors used to say in university all the time. Location, location, location matters a lot. Um, not only in terms of, you know, gathering spots and having iconic buildings and whatnot, but in terms of the time of day, you know, why am I shooting New York City? Where in New York City am I going to shoot? Uh, thinking about the context as much as possible in the setting uh, allows you to create better content. And when it comes to architecture photography, location is key. What type of photo are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to get an aerial shot? Are you trying to do a look up? Are you trying to do a look down? Are you trying to get a ground level image? Are you trying to get a very close up image of the building? So you might have to go really, I guess, eye to eye to the building, get as much elevation as you can, but we're not talking about rooftoping. We're just talking about maybe find a, a cool stairway and you know have that perspective view of the, the building that you want to shoot. So a lot of things to think about. I think that's part of the architectural photography experience is kind of discovering those spaces and really meandering around the city, which is what we did. Now, other things I want to talk about are interior photography. Interior photography in terms of architecture is very important. A lot of people forget that there's an interior space to a building. It's not just shooting it from a distance. Uh, so we try to enter as many buildings as we could so I can give, give you guys a little bit more perspective on that front. Uh, it's sometimes difficult. A lot of these buildings are, especially in New York City, they're very busy, they're touristy. So it's not, you're, you're not going to get an image where there's not someone in it to obstruct your view and whatnot. But we try to find places that maybe that could host the opportunity for you guys to shoot and to explore. So look out for that. Now the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is timing. Timing is very important. When are you shooting these buildings? Um, are you trying to get as much sunlight as possible? Are you trying to just get night photography? Um, I usually try to shoot three times of the day, uh, either sunrise, sunset, or during the nighttime. For the sake of this video and how cold and tired we were in New York, uh, we avoided night photography just because it just allowed us to have some time to relax so we can get up and do sunrises again. But we shot sunrise and sunset almost every single day. That being said, in terms of shooting sunrise and sunset, you get a diversity of type of photos that you can capture because uh, what happens is when you shoot sunrise, you're basically waking up tonight and you're waiting for the sun to come up. So you might get even some daylight as well and you might get some night photos if you get up extremely early. But in some cases, we never want to do that. We just want the sun and maybe some few photos during the day. The benefit of shooting at sunset is that you get nighttime right after the sun sets and that creates a very interesting um, color palette in terms of the hues that you're gonna get and the colors and everything else that starts to appear in your image. It's also during the time of day that you'd be awake typically so it's not as overwhelming but sunrise is highly recommended. I think waking up for sunrise allows you to wake up with a clear mind of what you wanna go shoot, so you're not really thinking about much else. You're just thinking about getting out there and capturing the best content you can. And for architecture, it works really well because there's not gonna be a lot of people in your photos. You're gonna get the city empty as much as possible, and you're probably gonna capture photos that you might have missed completely because of how much uh, noise and you know busyness there is in a city such as New York City such as New York City. I said city like 12 times there. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about, and this is kind of 
overarching and very long is shooting techniques. This is probably what you guys have been waiting for quite a while now. What I mean by shooting techniques is that in order to shoot buildings or to shoot a city, you really have to think about the type of styles of photography or the, the techniques that you would apply in order to capture the best possible image. Now, for me, what I learned over the years is by applying my knowledge from urban planning and architecture, I was able to actually capture buildings in a, in a different way. I applied what is called the universal design principles to the way I shoot buildings because these principles were created for designers and architects and, and anyone who's really in a creative field to think about how to not only describe something but to create it and how the process of creating it is determined by using these principles. Uh, I'm going to list them off for you guys so you can get an understanding. Maybe some of you already know them. We have balance, rhythm, uh, pattern, emphasis, contrast, movement and unity. Each is very unique and each encompasses a very specific value in having a, a way of describing buildings or describing a photo or architectural idea. Alright guys, so let's talk about these principles and how you might be able to utilize them when you're shooting, uh, specifically architectural buildings of course. Now the first one is called balance. Balance actually has three different components in it. Uh, it talks about symmetry, asymmetry and radical symmetry. I'm going to show you guys photo examples of each so that you can get an understanding of how that might work. Now the first image is of Brooklyn Bridge and we caught that during sunrise and of course many of you know the bridge is symmetrical. So symmetry uh, is defined as both sides of a composition have the same elements in the same position. It's almost like a mirror. Now that one's simple, right? Asymmetry on the other hand is when the composition is balanced due to the contrast of any other elements of the art. So here's an example of a building uh, designed by Frank Gehry who's actually from Toronto. It's called the Beekman Tower. Now the Beekman Tower as you can see from this image is symmetrical in terms of its actual structure but the design isn't and there is a balance created because of the contrast. Uh, the next one is called Radical Symmetry. Now this one is explained as when elements are equally spaced around the center point. And here's an example from Fulton subway station. It was designed by uh, Nicholas Grimshaw. Now, if you look you know, directly into the center of the image, you get symmetry, but then at the same time, you get the radical symmetry because the design actually changes across. So those three techniques are very useful in terms of architecture photography. Try to think of ways of capturing them. I mean, they're very straightforward. You know, when you're going down the street and you see that the road has a line in the middle, you shoot it, that's a form of symmetry. Now radical symmetry and asymmetry are other forms of it, so start to think outside the box and seeing how you can incorporate those into your images as well. Now the next principle I want to talk to you guys about is contrast. Contrast may be pretty simple and straightforward, but at the same time it is challenging because in order to create contrast in the image, you really have to find a unique spot to shoot that specific building. Now for this example, I have a shot that was taken from the Rockefeller building and it's looking directly at the One World Trade Center, but then you get the, the moon in the background. The contrast there is actually not the objects, but the colors. It's the color of the warmth versus the dark tones. And contrast is defined as a difference between elements of art in a composition such that each element made stronger in relation to the other. When placed next to each other, contrasting elements command the viewer's attention. So this is a perfect example where you get yellows that are commanding your attention and you're not really focusing too much on the darker areas. Emphasis is another principle um, and it's defined as when the art creates an area of the composition that is visually dominant um, and commands the viewer's attention. So this example right here, it's very obvious where the attention is coming. It's either in the clouds or it's in the architectural buildings themselves, but the focus is driving your attention to the building. So that's a good way of really harnessing directional photography in terms of architecture and getting those kind of uh, images that, you know, although there's so many other things happening in it, you're still focusing on the buildings itself. Movement is the next principle and it's defined as the result of using elements of the art such that they move the viewer's eye uh, around within the image. Very self-explanatory. And here's an example from a subway shot in New York where lines and remember leading lines, I talk about this a lot, 
leading lines are a good way of leading someone's eye into uh, a certain perspective or a certain location. So in this case, the subway lines, the way that they're running, they're moving you. And that's a really unique way of capturing architectural buildings or interiors. It allows you to create a perspective and I think a composition that is, is awesome because if you have a person there in the back, then your eyes are drastically changing and directionally towards focusing on them. The next one is pattern and it's defined as the uniform repetition of any elements of art and any combination thereof. So in this case, I'm showing you guys examples of fly iron. Now you can see the pattern in the way that the windows are designed, in the ways that even the, the air conditioners are placed. It's very kind of repetitive in some sense. And that's what pattern is. It's a repetition of things that happen in an image. And it's a good way of capturing images, uh, especially when it comes to buildings and architecture specifically. Rhythm is created by the movement implied through the repetition of elements that are non-uniform but organized in a certain way. So these, as you can see, although the interiors are not uniform, the exterior of the building and the ways that everything is organized is, is very uniform. And that is rhythm. It's, it's creating this kind of, you know, episode of, of movement in your image. Now, with this photo, this is a form of architecture. It's called facades architectural. And I always enjoy taking pictures of facades of buildings because in them you get the repetition, you get the rhythm, and you get a lot of the other principles that you try to capture in architecture. And I think that you guys should try to do that when you're shooting buildings. Just get closer to it and try to find those areas where there's repetition and some sort of rhythm and capture it. So the last principle I wanna to talk to you guys about is called unity or variety for lack of better words. And it's defined as the feeling that you'd get such that all the elements fit together comfortably in your photo. In this case, we have a picture of Queensborough Bridge and we were shooting it outside the window and I was trying to get a photo of it so that it showed the, the entirety of the, of the structure, which is, I guess, the unit. And then as it gradually decreases in size and it creates that variety. But the thing is with unity and variety, you don't want too much variety because then you get chaos. You want it to be gradual so that the differences are easy on the eyes. Now, there also has to be area for your eyes to rest in terms of this principle. So in this case, the resting point is at the very end when the structure is smaller. And I think unity is a good way of looking at buildings because everything is so radical sometimes and seeing it from a specific angle will change the way that you're able to capture the image and, and therefore share it with your audience. Those are the principles, the universal design principles and how I use them to capture buildings and architectural buildings specifically. But there's so many other things I look for and one of them is actually people and incorporating people in the photo is a good way of uh, shooting buildings. Now, having a model in front of your building or a part of the building shows proportion. And I think that's very important. Proportion and scale are a good way of showing the mass and size of a building. So in this case, I had my friend Alana stand in front of the Empire State Building and I had changed focus versus on her and then the, uh, the building itself. But that's a unique way of capturing the architecture is by having a person there. And it brings a little bit more life and character, I think. So that's something that I think you guys should always think about in your photos, you know, how, when you step aside, can you put someone in there as a subject to help you illustrate the story or tell the story more compellingly? A lot of times you see people, you know, shooting someone in front of a cafe, sitting down and having a coffee and you get to see the space or interiors, you know, when you get someone to stand at the very end and it's symmetrical and there all the lines are leading to one subject. Those are interesting ways. So I urge you guys to really think outside the box in terms of architectural photography and try to find ways that you can capture it that is very distinctive and that utilizes some of these principles that I mentioned. Some other techniques that I use to capture buildings is very simple and I think these are just like, hey, when you're there, you, you gotta do all these angles. You know, first, you gotta look down. So can you get on top of the building and do a look down? And if you can, you, get, you might get an image like this. Another one is, can you do a look up? And by looking up, you might see that the buildings are very close to each other and you might get a photo like this. Another method is flying over the city. So we did a helicopter ride with uh, Fly on Air and I can't even begin to describe how thrilling that experience is. It was a little cold. <laughs> It was actually very cold, but I mean, it's the time of the year, but it was so fun, so much fun. And I, I managed to get some really cool shots. Actually, I wanna share some of those with you guys. So here are some photos that you could expect if you went on a, on a helicopter ride over New York City. Okay.
photography is one of those methods that I do recommend. Uh, I mean, it's not obviously the easiest one to get to, but if you are in a major city like New York and you can go on a helicopter ride, do it. You get to see the buildings in a completely different light. I studied urban planning, so it was always about looking down on a city and seeing the buildings and the way that the city functions. But when you're in a helicopter, you can somewhat get closer to the building and shoot it and get that perspective that you might otherwise not be able to. Now, when you're on ground level, of course, you can also shoot directly towards the building. I always try to recommend getting closer to the building and get detailed shots. So in this case, here's the examples of Chrysler building that we managed to get some really cool footage from. So the Chrysler building photos are a great illustration of how you can get closer to a building. I mean, you have to have sometimes connections with good friends and whatnot, but if you can get a detailed shot of the building, then that's another form of architectural photography that is very valuable. Other methods are obviously shooting iconic buildings from a distance. And what I mean by that is focusing on having them stand alone and everything else being somewhat uh, secondary in the image. We went to actually one of my favorite locations and this happened. So after waking up for sunrise, we hit up uh, Brooklyn Bridge and then I gave Mallory the idea of going to Wall Street to hit up Delmonico's, which is this really interesting building that intersects at a corner. Uh, many people have seen it. It's one of the most photographed uh, locations in New York City. But just our luck, it's fully under renovation. <laughs> it's okay, I have thousands of photos of this place. So you might not luck out sometimes, but that's okay because there's so many other buildings that you can photograph. The last thing I recommend doing when you're shooting architecture buildings is just getting creative and really thinking outside the box and how you can capture them. There's so many other methods uh, that you can utilize in shooting architecture. And I think another one to mention briefly is uh, looking at puddles as an example. You can shoot puddles and get that amazing reflection. I've seen guys even hold like uh, mirrors in their hands and kind of get reflection shots off of mirrors, which is really interesting because you can create some really cool pictures off of that. Uh, now with any picture and any architecture photography, you want to be as creative as you can and allow yourself to really dive into that space and see it in all angles. It's about exploring the space around you. And I think that when you get to an iconic building, especially in New York City, don't just take that stereotypical shot everyone else is shooting. If you're standing in front of a whole bunch of tourists, think of ways of getting around them, getting closer to the building, see if you can get a higher elevation shot, see if you can get a closer shot, really diversify that area of photography that you can capture so that you come back feeling like, wow, I captured all angles of this building and it looks absolutely incredible. Because when you're telling your story, it's so much more compelling and so much more I think valuable to have all that diversity rather than that just one shot that everyone else would probably expect. All right guys, so I could talk for hours about more techniques on shooting architecture photography, but I'm gonna drive myself crazy. So I'm gonna end the video off here. I do hope you guys enjoyed it. I mean, these are tips and techniques I've been using for a very long time. And each of them I think would be valuable method for you guys to try to utilize. And when you're getting out there and exploring, like I always say, be as creative as you can and really think about what you're shooting. Don't just shoot anything. Learn a little bit about the architecture, learn about the history of it and, and put more value to your work. I think a lot of people just shoot all the time and they're not really you know, realizing the reason they're shooting. And I think one of the reasons why I began shooting architecture was because of my interest in it. I've always had this compelling urge to be an architect and to this day, I still incorporate it somehow even through my photos and my video. And this video wouldn't be possible, like I mentioned previously, if it wasn't for Epidemic Sound. Because of them, we got to travel to New York City. We got to create this incredible video for you guys and share with you this unique way of really diversifying the type of videos that you guys do and adding sound and sound effects to your, to your videos so that it seems a lot more real and almost like you're there in New York City and you can hear the traffic and the noise of the city. So check out Epidemic Sound. Like I said, the links in my bio. And always remember to like, subscribe, and comment. And I'll see you guys all next week. Peace.